Yeah, yeah, Vatutin's still advancing. He, huh? He must be Vatutin his horn. No, 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 no. January 14th, 1944. The war in the north of the USSR up near Leningrad, has been a stalemate for nearly two and a half years, and the city has been under siege all that time. But plans have been afoot for an offensive to end the siege and destroy the enemy. And this week, that offensive begins. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Soviet attacks in Ukraine actually managed to push into formerly Polish territory. The Germans also made a withdrawal in the north, though that was a strategic one. The Americans made new landings on New Guinea, and the Australians also advanced there. American's top flying ace was shot down over Rabaul, and plans are ever more solid for an amphibious landing at Anzio in Italy, behind the enemy lines. Okay. I've talked a couple of times about that operation, scheduled to go off January 22nd, but here is some more detail. Before it happens, 5th Army is to launch a big offensive that will tie down the enemy, draw in his reinforcements from around Rome and Anzio, and then break into the Leary Valley and head north to be in a position to meet up with the landing force or at least support it. That's a lot. To achieve this, the French Expeditionary Corps is to hit the enemy north of Monte Cassino and take the heights there, the British are to take Sant'Ambrogio, and then the Americans, the 36th Division, will attack across the Rapido River at the mouth of the valley. Once they've made a bridgehead, then the 1st Armoured will pass through them and head north towards Anzio. Obviously, this all has to happen either before the 22nd or very soon afterwards. The French do attack the 12th into the mountains above and behind Casino, and the last two days of the week see ferocious short-range combat, but the attackers are unable to achieve their objectives. Which is also the case in parts of the Soviet Union. Stavka has ordered Ivan Bagramian's 1st Baltic and Vasily Sokolovsky's Western Fronts to break through 3rd Panzer Army's defenses. The attacks are to go off the 6th and the 8th. Bagramian's attacks west and northwest of Vitebsk last until today and make almost no progress at all. Stavka orders them to continue though, and they will off and on until the 24th, with pretty much the same results. Sokolovsky's attacks east of Vitebsk go off as planned and over two days manage to take Dinamovo and push nearly five kilometers into the enemy defenses, but they make no more progress the rest of the week. Konstantin Rokossovsky's Belarusian Front has been ordered to take Mozir and Kalinkovici with attacks by 65th and 61st Armies. These attacks begin the 8th against fierce resistance. New assaults the 11th, however, just shatter the German defenses and the Soviets surge forward north of Kalinkovici, advancing as much as 18 kilometers that day. The next few days see the enemy pulling or being pushed back both there and east of the town. Meanwhile, Cavalry units have raced around the enemy and outflanked him at Mozir. By the end of the 12th, final assaults against Mozir and Kalinkovici already from pretty much all sides. And today, as the week ends, the Soviets take both Mozir and Kalinkovici and close up to the Ipa River, creating a big salient in the German lines. Further south, on the 9th, Nikolai Vatutin's 1st Ukrainian Front takes Polonoye, halfway between Berdichev and Rovno. Now, his right wing is heading for Sarny, and 13th Army reaches the Gorin and Steer rivers by the 12th. They take Koretz the 13th. Stavka then has Vatutin order 13th and 60th Armies to a halt. I mean, He's on a seriously broad front, like, like 450 kilometers. And though a lot of his force has been really moving, gaps are appearing between some of the formations. Ammunition is running low for all of his armies by this point. So the 12th, Stavka orders Vatutin's left wing and Ivan Konyev's 2nd Ukrainian front right wing to join flanks at Shpola so they can destroy the German salient at Zvienigorod and Mironovka. This would not only make the junction of the two fronts secure, but would set the stage for an advance to the southern Bug River. But that is easier said than done. This salient goes all the way to Kanyev on the Dnieper, this Korsun-Shevchenkovsky salient. 
It's full of hills, just made for defending, and bristling with 12 German divisions from 1st Panzer Army and 8th Army. So, 1st Ukrainian Front is ordered over to defense, partly to reinforce here, but also so that their supply lines can catch up to the strung out right wing. Batutin and Konya then begin putting together force for a Korsun operation. It will be 27 rifle divisions, 4 tank corps, and 1 mechanized corps. So something in the neighborhood of 4,000 big guns and mortars and 370 tanks will assemble over the next week or so to soon hit the Korsun salient. Some words about Batutin's attacks since Christmas Eve. After 22 days of operations, Batutin's front began to slow up, outrunning its supplies and struggling in the mud, for the winter failed to come to the south. The Zhitomir attack had been a conspicuous success, but the command decision to spread the front armies amidst objectives running from Sarny to Vinitsa and Zmerinka has come in for certain criticism. Those orders went out when the front had spent its reserves. First Ukrainian could not reach the southern Bug, capture Vinitsa and Zmerinka, and encircle German troops at Zvenigorodka. After the fall of Zhitomir, concentrating on the left flank and closing with Konyev might have been more productive. At the end of last week, elements of Konyev's second Ukrainian front launched some attacks near Kirovograd and even broke into the city's suburbs by the end of the week. As this week gets going, they clear the city of the enemy already the 8th and advance some 15 kilometers west of town. As for the 3rd and 4th Ukrainian fronts even further south, we saw over the past weeks unsuccessful attempts to take Krivoy Rog and Nikopol. Stavka has by now issued formal orders for those points to be taken as soon as possible, because until that happens, the German defenses are well entrenched and anchored by the Kamenka and Dnieper rivers, and you cannot break those defenses without taking those hinge points. Hey, here's an interesting story about the Nikopol attacks the other week that I didn't have a chance to get to. In the first attempt to rush the town, the 44th Army under Khomenko, an NKVD officer who made good as a commander, was badly mauled. Khomenko and his artillery commander S.A. Bobkov, driving to a forward headquarters, took the one road that ran through German positions, coming under murderous fire. Bobkov was killed in the first salvo, and Khomenko sustained fatal wounds. The German radio announced the desertion of two senior Soviet officers. In a rage, Stalin ordered the disbanding of 44th Army, its units to be distributed to other commands. Only later in 1944, on the interrogation of a German prisoner, did the truth come out. Anyhow, on the 10th, 3rd Ukrainian Front attacks towards Apostolovo, and on the 12th, 4th U attacks again against the Nikopol bridgehead. Neither of these attacks meets with success for the rest of the week. Army Chief of Staff Alexander Vasilevsky has ordered that last attack to go off now because he thinks the Germans are likely to withdraw from Nikopol. This is not the case. Erich von Manstein last week asked Adolf Hitler for permission to withdraw from both Nikopol and the Crimea to shorten his lines, but this was refused. And today, in the far north, something long planned finally begins. An offensive by the Leningrad, Volkhov, and Second Baltic Fronts to relieve Leningrad, which has been under siege for like 850 days. If you were to look at the Leningrad area battlefront, you might think it belonged more to the Great War than to this war. From the barbed wire to the trenches and all of the heavy fixed positions, it is very much a throwback. And for those 850 days, German and Soviet gunners have fought the longest artillery duel in history, even as life goes on in the city under fire. The trams still run, and since last January when the total blockade was at least pierced, it's become somewhat less of a nightmare. But it is unending danger and always possible sudden death for the denizens of the city. They do have an oil pipeline to the city by now, and the trains run the gauntlet of guns along the southern shore of Lake Ladoga to bring in supplies. So there are even factories producing there, and not quite so many people dying of starvation. German 18th Army rings the city, and 16th Army holds the line down the river Lovar, and together they keep a lid on the Baltics. But here's the thing. As we have seen, 
German high command has slowly but steadily taken troops from here to beef up other sectors. And they've also replaced many top-notch divisions here with ones of much lower caliber. They still man pretty comprehensive defense lines. Two more lines behind the first, and behind them a third defense zone and a rear defense line from Pskov to Ostra. But by this time, Stavka thinks 18th Army right for the taking, and they've been building up for this offensive for months. They've especially been massing artillery. In 1941, when they stopped the German drive here, there were eight big guns per kilometer. Now it is to be 140. The tiny Baltic fleet has even been moving men and equipment by night until the ice in the Gulf of Finland thickened in late December. By then, the tanks and self-propelled guns had been brought in to the 300-meter piers at Lysinos. Since then, transport planes have been flying in staff and artillery. They're trying to give the impression that they're evacuating the bridgehead, but they've actually brought in tens of thousands of men, 600 big guns, and brigades and regiments of T-34 tanks. Leonid Govorov's Leningrad Front, Kirill Meretskov's Volkhov Front, and Markian Popov's Second Baltic Fronts are to do the job. Attacks against 18th Army by the first two are to destroy the flanks, and then they will thrust towards Luga and trap the main German force, ideally. Second Baltic is to keep 16th busy, and after 18th's destruction, all three fronts will aim for Narva and Pskov, freeing the whole region and setting the stage to enter the Baltic states. On the 11th, they go over the final plans. Govorov has 33 rifle divisions, three rifle brigades, and an air army. Meretskov has 22 rifle divisions, six rifle brigades, four tank brigades, and an air army. Popov has 45 rifle divisions, three rifle brigades, and four tank brigades, and an air army for tactical support. It is Second Shock Army who are to begin the attacks from the Oranian Baum bridgehead. And when is this offensive to begin? Today. At 9.30 this morning, the artillery barrage begins, 65 minutes long and 100,000 rounds strong, and then second shock goes into action. They advance three kilometers this day along an eight kilometer front, and 90th Division reaches the German second defense line. Leningrad is shrouded in mist tonight. When Ivan Maslenikov's 42nd Army assault troops get into positions, their main attack is to begin tomorrow with the dawn. At the end of last week, the Allies were beginning other attacks over in the Solomon Islands. They began flying missions out of Piva Uncle Airfield on Bougainville. Light and medium bombers from there can easily reach Rabaul and continue their campaign of aerial attrition. The first mission, however, cost seven planes for no gains. The next mission, on January 9th, proved more successful and an indication of things to come. Seven TBFs and 24 SBDs hit Tobera. The Japanese response was ferocious. Despite this, the Dauntlesses systematically worked over the anti-aircraft positions. Then, at medium altitudes, the Avengers dropped 2,000-pound bombs on the paved runway. Although the Japanese were able to shoot down three escorting fighters and one SBD, Tobera was temporarily shut down by the raid. It was the first time any Rabaul airbase was shut down due to bomb damage, even if it was temporary. On the 11th comes a raid against planes parked on the ground at Vuna Canal that damages eight of them. Raids continue today. Well, last night, actually. First, a nighttime B-24 raid against Vuna Canal. Then B-25 raids today against targets in New Ireland and then New Britain. The Japanese send up 84 fighters against this. The bombers are well guarded, though two are lost. Two fighters are also lost, and the Japanese lose three planes, but seven ships are damaged in Simpson Harbor. As I've said before, it's a lot easier for the Allies to make up the losses in planes, men, and ships than it is for the Japanese. And over in New Guinea, on the 11th, the Allies make the airfield at Saidor operational once again. And here are a few notes to end the week. 
On the 9th, British troops take Maunda in Burma, which could be an important port for Allied supplies. This is the 5th Indian Infantry Division. On the 11th in Italy, Count Galeazzo Ciano is executed by Benito Mussolini's fascist sympathizers. Already the 8th, Mussolini's Italian Socialist Republic tries the former members of the fascist Grand Council who overthrew him last summer. Ciano was not only Italy's foreign minister, but also Mussolini's son-in-law. On the 12th, the SS United Victory, the first victory ship, is launched in Oregon. She will be completed at the end of February. These ships are a similar idea to the Liberty ships, but faster, larger, and with a longer range. They are to be quickly built in large numbers to make up for ships lost to U-boats, although just about no Allied ships are being lost to U-boats these days. And so we come to the end of another week of the war. With plans afoot for a big offensive in Italy, a big offensive beginning in the USSR, and ever more aerial attacks against the Japanese in the South Seas. And in Germany, on January 11th, there is again the bombing of Oskarsleben. We cover the whole bombing campaign in depth and its questionable military effect on our War Against Humanity series. Thing is, this particular raid, right, flies into the teeth of nasty weather. So all the wings are recalled, except for the 1st Air Division and one wing from the 3rd Air Division. They're already close to their targets, so they get the green light. However, they only now have one fighter group as escort. The Germans take full advantage of this and 60 B-17s are lost. One individual lost is Tech Sergeant Benton Lowry, 30 years old, four kids. He was the great-grandfather of one of our interns. This is a letter he wrote to his family at Christmas 1943. Dearest kids, Daddy has received your Christmas box and also the very nice card you sent me and it sure made me very happy to have you think of me. It always makes me feel good to hear from you and I wish I could spend Christmas with you. I know Santa Claus will be very nice and besides a lot of toys, you might even get a new suit or dress so I know my sweethearts are going to be all set. My Christmas is gonna be awful blue because I will be wishing to be with you. It takes about two weeks for your letters to get here to me and I don't get half enough. You're just going to have to write often so you can keep me cheered up. I read your letters over and over. I sure miss you an awful lot. Take good care of yourself and you have all my love and kisses. Daddy. He had not gotten their response letter back yet when he died. See you next time.